Hello. Can you guys hear me okay? I, I kind of feel like Jan Jackson with this thing on, so if I start dancing, uh, it's okay. Um, my name is Georgia Gras, o para la gente que habla español, Jorge Agras. Uh, a couple of fun facts about me. Um, I walked 26,000 steps yesterday, according to this thing, so if I'm a little tired, uh, that's why. Uh, I have actually been to this hotel uh, 28 years ago. Uh, I'll tell you guys the story later if you're really curious. It's as beautiful as I remember it. Um, and I, I have a new title now. I'm the Associate Director of Platform Development for One Stop Internet. Um, and at One Stop, I like to give things crazy names. You know, why call it the you know, OSAPI 2.0 when you can call it something cool? So these are the two words you're going to hear a lot during this presentation. I figured I'd talk about what they really mean. Uh, Avalon, a uh, legendary island in the Arthurian legend, and phantom, a ghost or figment of the imagination. So think of these things and uh, then tell me what you think they mean. So for whoever in this room doesn't know who we are, uh, we're One Stop Internet. Uh, we were founded in 2003. Uh, we are headquartered in Los Angeles with additional offices in New York. Uh, we provide e-commerce, logistics, uh, and marketing and business intelligence support to about 40 brands. Uh, we've been using Orchard since 2011, so we're kind of an early adopter. Uh, and our e-commerce chain is entirely built as a series of Orchard modules, uh, or maybe for not much longer, according to Nick, there'll be packages soon. Um, we use the CMS for brand engagement and content updates. A lot of our partners have a lot of crazy content they like to put on their sites, so the CMS is great for that. And we have one-step layouts and slideshows, which we use a lot. We launched last year, and I actually have updated versions on this flash drive, so you guys will get to uh, maybe download those today, if we have somewhere to upload them to. Um, so, liftoff. Uh, we did a lot of accelerated development in 2014. Um, up until that time, we had launched about four major sites on Orchard. Um, I'm excluding our mobile sites, which we talked about last year, and our transactional email system is also run entirely in Orchard. So, you know, every partner has an Orchard instance that at very least does their email. But excluding all of those, we launched about four major sites. Uh, we had six new site launches in 2014. So all of the development we'd done up until that point, we did more of it in one year than the previous three years combined. We have replatformed five sites off of our legacy platform onto Orchard starting in 2014 and um, continuing today. Uh, and they're some of our largest sites. Uh, and we're launching four new sites this year on Orchard. So it went from kind of, you know, I don't want to say an experiment, but kind of, you know, it was the new platform for the longest time. Now it's the platform. Now basically, you know, this is it. We're all in. Um, our engineering staff was held somewhat constant in size. We didn't, you know, double in size to accommodate all this new development. Um, and all of our new sites are responsive, tablet first, all those good things that uh, was talked about in the keynote. Yeah, we're doing all that stuff now. So launching a site in 2014 was a little hairy. Um, we would take about 10 to 12 weeks of development for you know basic site from when it was provisioned to when QA would basically say, yes, you can launch it. Uh, anything more than that, and there are many sites more than that, was 14 weeks. We've had some take 16 weeks. Um, it's a lot of time. Uh, our sites would launch with an average of 25 open bugs. This is stuff we know is broken, but we're launching you anyway. Um, our maintenance team would spend about 100 hours cleaning up after a launch. And this is all the stuff that, oh no, it's supposed to be there, but we just need to you know, do a little bit more work for you. Uh, QA and UAT testing basically happened on the fly. Uh, okay, it's done, test it. Oh no, wait, let me fix it again, we'll test it again. So that was a, a process fraught with a lot of anxiety for us. Um, and when we launched a site, it was kind of like launching the space shuttle. We had a conference call, and people were all in a war room, and you know, it, it, it looked, I don't know, kind of like we were trying to literally launch the shuttle. So it was, it was, a, it was a big deal. Um, so we thought we can do this better. Uh, we want to reduce the cost of our launches, both in time, uh, sweat equity, you know, anxiety, stomach linings. We want to make it less expensive. Uh, reduce the cost of maintenance. So just because we've launched you on this fabulous new platform doesn't mean that you know, we should burn more of your maintenance hours maintaining you. It should actually be easier to maintain. 
Uh, we want to ease the deployment of new features. The whole point of having this modular you know, platform is that we can roll new stuff out and you know, your stuff should just upgrade, should just migrate, should be very easy. Uh, and we want to achieve scalability without hiring every engineer in Los Angeles. Um, as you all know, Orchard engineers are kind of you know, still a little hard to find. I think probably most of them in the world are in this room today. Uh, so we're like, how do, we, how do we get more productive without you know, hiring a bunch more people and training them? And we wanted to find a way to balance the need for custom implementations with the need for some level of consistency on our platform. So how do you balance, you know, oh, I want special Snowflake versus they should all work the same. So we had what we thought was a great idea, master, master themes. I don't know if any of you guys remember this. We would have a, a big master theme on top, and then we'd hang all these child themes underneath it. Uh, this is what we kind of thought we would gain from it. You know, what we could basically take a bunch of sites that were going to work the same way and just deploy them very quickly. Uh, we could develop them very quickly, maintain them easily, and you know, it would be easy to fix a bug because we find a bug in the master theme, we just fix it once and it's deployed everywhere, you know, one stop, bam. We figured there might be some minuses. Uh, this one change going out to all sites instantly, eh, we knew we'd have to be careful with that. Um, it obviously increases the complexity of any overrides that we would do um, at the theme level to override stuff in the platform, because now we've got this master theme layer that's sitting in between them. So we'd have to bear that in mind. Um, we knew that the sites would kind of be chained together now because they're all based on the same master theme, but we figured this was an acceptable compromise. Um, and we presented last year. I don't know who remembers our presentation from last year. Uh, remember this fabulous diagram? See all the little happy child themes hanging off our master theme, and we did some great slides. Um, you know, see the little happy professor there in the corner? It was awesome. Um, and it was going to be great, and it was going to be wonderful, and then we tried it. It didn't go so well. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, not, not, not well at all. Um, so we did get some actual pluses out of this. Uh, sites with a common look and feel, we were able to launch them very quickly. Um, we were able to easily create a group of websites that you know, kind of look and operate and up, you know, are updated the same way. Um, and we enabled one update to be deployed many places very quickly. So all of that stuff that we thought we would get, we got. There are a couple of things that we didn't realize we got with it. Uh, the master themes, uh, and this is probably more of a process failure than any kind of failure in the framework, because the framework actually worked exactly the way it was designed, but they became this weird shadow platform where people would, oh, well, the platform doesn't do this for us yet, you know, we'll put it in the master theme. So we found controllers in the master theme. We found really detailed JavaScript modules to do stuff like pagination and infinite scroll. Like, really? Like, it's a theme. It's not supposed to do any of that stuff. Um, and then we had the child themes hanging underneath it, so this, this layer became very, very thick, and it was very hard to, to manage, um, because we had this weird functionality now that was, it was really you know, neither fish nor fowl. It wasn't really in the platform, it wasn't really theme level, it was kind of this weird, weird space. Uh, the sites were actually now tied together for all eternity. Uh, you had to update them all at the same time, so if we found a bug in one of the master themes, we'd have to update all the sites and deploy all the sites at the same time. And, and some partners don't want that. They're like, no, I'm happy with the site the way it is. I don't, I don't want you to deploy a potentially you know, a damaging update. Um, we had a lot of shape template overrides. Um, so we have an, a view model layer on top of our Orchard framework, which is basically written mostly knockout. That became very, very brittle. Um, anytime we would change anything at the platform level, we'd change one of the JavaScript modules, we'd you know, change, we'd update something, we'd, we'd make it better. Uh, the theme and master theme combination you know, had all of these attachment points that were now burned into it, so they would just break. So that was very annoying. Um, we created a lot of unseen and unaccounted for technical debt. Uh, just a lot of stuff that now had to be maintained, now had to be chased after. Didn't really count on that. And our platform raced ahead while these sites are, and you know, we're and are still stuck in the past. We have some sites that are 50 builds behind our current build. And we now have to figure out a way to get them there because they want all these new features that, while well, you're in you know, build 1985 and you know, that has all the features you want, but you're only on like 1971. So 
didn't go so well. Um, so we had what I like to call a revolution of launch in early 2015. After living with this for a year, uh, we're like, okay, it's time to reset. It's time to think about what we're doing here. Uh, and we need to think about things a little bit differently. So the first thing was a, a slight change of perception. We're not trying to launch the shuttle here. We're just trying to sell some jeans. Uh, every time we'd launch a site, it was kind of like the second coming. And we're like, let's keep things in perspective. Uh, not everybody involved in a site launch uh, has to have a nervous breakdown and be sent flowers. Uh, we'd like to make this an easy process, a repeatable process, uh, a calming process. Um, we need to, to think about features, stuff we're building as a feature versus stuff we're building for brand. Um, we kind of would always say, well, you know, it's this brand wants it, everyone else is going to want it, let's make a feature. Um, maybe we don't really need to do that as much. Um, and now, you know, we tried this master theme, child theme thing, and that didn't go so well. So what we do build, where, where are we going to put it, and where is it going to go? Um, and how do we get there? You know, we're, we're already six sites into this, and, and we're changing the world again. Um, so we started to think, let's think a little bit outside the box. Uh, who has this problem already and has maybe solved it? And I'm not talking about web developers or you know, digital technology in the whole wide world. Uh, who, who's done this? So we've, we looked at automakers. This is actually a very interesting comparison. Um, they have mostly moved to building a platform as opposed to building just a single car. So they have a big group of parts and they produce a whole bunch of different products from that group of parts. Um, there are a bunch of advantages, as you can guess. Uh, common components can be tested in known configurations. So you have you know, 25 major components. You can put them together in a known number of combinations. Uh, you have a known number of use cases to test for. This is awesome. Um, under the skin, uh, all these big pieces you know, are kind of repeated over and over. So you build one piece well. You know, it's going to work well in a bunch of different applications. Uh, all these pieces have standard interfaces, so they're easy to swap out. Um, and you can reduce complexity and cost and still build products that you know, serve different markets, different price points. So you, you get a lot of variety, a lot of bang for your buck here. Some disadvantages, um, obviously, the branding and customer experience has to be carefully managed. Um, you don't want everything to look the same. I think GM was the worst at that in the 1970s. And obviously, greater component commonality means that if one of them is broken, you're going to have broken things all over the place. Just ask Toyota, ask Volkswagen. Uh, so things can blow up. Um, and all automakers are moving to this pattern. Toyota is launching their uh, global architecture. Volkswagen has this MQB thing. They want to basically take all of the cars they make worldwide and boil it down to four or five different platforms. So this is a very interesting comparison. I have this fabulous chart. You can see you know, there's three major platforms, and all of these cars are basically built with the same components. So we're thinking, you know, this is a really interesting model. How can we apply this model to our business? Uh, so, if our sites were cars, what would they be? And we picked two. Uh, so, we have on the left, um, the Toyota Avalon. I don't know if anyone in the United States is familiar with this car. Um, they make a lot of them, it's mass produced. Um, there's about 190 configurations we know about, uh, based on all the options. Um, getting a hybrid, it's good for the environment. Uh, starts at about 32,000, so it's you know, not a cheap car, but it's definitely in the range of a lot of consumers. And you can maybe push it to $45,000. Uh, Toyota sells about 67,000 of them, so they sell a lot of these guys. And you can get it now. You can walk up and just say, hey, I want one of these. So this is one model, um, kind of a car that meets everyone's needs. The other side, we have something a little bit more custom, the Rolls-Royce Phantom. Um, they build the components in Germany, ship them to the UK. Sorry, Nick. Um, uh, big BMW. Um, there are a million configurations with this car, if you look at all the standard options. And then it, they'll build whatever you want. So the number of configurations is basically unlimited. Um, there's no hybrid, sorry, but the V12 is really fast. Uh, $474,000 is what this starts at. Um, so that's, it's a big chunk of change. $90,000 in options is typical. Um, you can actually option over a million dollars. Uh, there are only 1,500 of these sold every year. 
and they're only built to order. So this, this whole concept uh, was revolutionary for people outside of engineering because they always thought that, well, a site's a site. You know, it's gonna take the same amount of time to build this site as, as it does to build that site. And we were like, no, there's certain things that you're asking for that is gonna put it in a spectrum between one of these two extremes. So we have on the left something pretty standard, you know, still some variations, and something on the right that's, that's very, very custom fit. So, so we broke up, you know, basically our sites are gonna sit somewhere in the spectrum. You know, the Avalon Express sites is what we're calling them now. Uh, our PDP, PLP, and CART are, are very standardized. Um, you know, they're kind of, they all work the same. Uh, all the content that they want is mostly the terms and conditions page, you know, the returns policy is pretty standard stuff. Um, Basically, most of what they need to launch is branding changes. They need their logo, they need colors, they need content updates, they need some crazy landing pages, which we use our layouts and templates modules and slideshow modules to achieve. All of that content can be executed basically with a CMS tool. So we have a, a team of CMS people that can, can go in there and, and do everything they need to do without any crazy custom programming. And this is about 70% of our sites uh, based on a survey that we did. Uh, then, on the other side, we have what we call our phantom sites. Um, highly, highly customized design. Uh, we had a, a partner that spent a million dollars in creative to do their website. Um, so I guess they have a lot of money. Custom content and functionality built to order. We may need to build some new platform level features for you, but you know, all of this stuff probably needs custom content types, custom shape templates. You know, we'll take the CMS tools that we currently have and glue them together in new and weird ways. Uh, the PDP, CART, and PLP are, are very non-standard. They're very, you know, designy and, and, and very new. Uh, and we've just added the ability to customize our checkout, which is something we've never done before. Uh, and Orchard has enabled us to do that based on some of the concepts I'm gonna talk about later. Um, and this is really not that many of our sites, it's about 30% of our sites, but they're big names, so it's actually the majority of our revenue. So this is, this is a market that's very important for us to figure out how to service. Um, so we have these two kind of categories of, of, of partners, and we want to build a common component set to service both their needs. So what do we do? So we, we started a project, you can tell I like cars, uh, called the Camry Project. Uh, my boss said it was the worst name ever he'd ever heard for any kind of a project, but we, we, we kept with it. So these were our goals. Uh, we wanted to reduce our site provision to QA certified time to uh, six weeks. So we wanted to cut our development time in half. Uh, and that was kind of a very ambitious goal for us. We wanted to reduce the burden on QA for new site launches because QA was tearing their hair out trying to test everything before the site would go live. Uh, we wanted to make maintenance easier with more admin settings and less of this you know, black box functionality that we seem to be really good at building. Uh, have a clear understanding of the time and effort required to launch a site. Uh, we had people making commitments for us that knew nothing about engineering, so we wanted to, if not stop that, at least tell them, well, if you want this and this, it's gonna take more time. Uh, and make this a repeatable, transparent process. Uh, we wanted to take away this kind of missile silo mentality away from site launches. Um, so the first thing we did was we worked with our product team to create a baseline. Uh, our current MVP had been, become a little outdated, so we built a whole bunch of wireframes that creative and product designed together. This was kind of another first for our company, uh, you know, creative working over here and product working over here. We actually put them together uh, to, to work together, which is good, I highly recommend it. We wanted them to follow current and anticipated trends. E-commerce is an always changing uh, build business, so we wanted to make sure that we weren't building something that was five years old. We wanted to allow some configurability. We know that everyone's not gonna want the same kind of website, so we wanted to make sure that there was some level of baseline configurability that we could build into the system. And we worked with the people who are actually doing the implementation to try to understand what pain points they had seen in the past. So it was a very holistic process. Uh, it took about maybe three months. And this is what we came up with. We call it the Avalon platform. So the concept was we wanted a very simple architecture, a very minimal number of files. We had some sites that were going out the door with two, 300 you know, files between styles and shape overrides and all this other stuff. And we wanted to really simplify that. 
We wanted to move towards a more semantic DOM model. We had a lot of crazy styling paradigms over the years, we wanted to get rid of all that, move to semantic HTML. Obviously, responsive design was very big for us because we wanted our sites to work well on mobile and tablet and all these other experiences. It's funny, a statistic, tablet and mobile are now the majority of our site traffic already, uh, with iPad being the biggest one, so this is a market we couldn't ignore. And we wanted to build some core components that would actually have multiple manifestations. So you'd have one component that had you know, different faces you could put on it. Uh, we also wanted a far better separation of concerns. We pulled all of our bootstrap and layout classes out of the markup. Uh, we wanted them to be bound to semantic IDs uh, and classes, and we would wire all that stuff up with some less mix-ins. Uh, we have, for the first time, a global variables file in our theme so that we could actually you know, control the branding at a central level. And we wanted to create a pattern and a way of working so that anything we built in the future, you could just hook it into this framework. So, so these, were, these were our concepts. Uh, the components we built, uh, so we have two different modes of operation. Our express sites, the site is actually a subset of the full platform capability, so it's, it's not everything the platform can do. We've, we take our functionality and prepackage it in a couple of different configurations so that when creative is creating the wireframes, they know they have four or five different choices. Uh, it makes everything just a lot easier. We install those components as whole units, so we kind of, it's a very repeatable process. And we've designed these sites to have a pretty low cost of launch and maintenance, and we can get them out the door pretty quickly. Whereas if we're doing a phantom site, these components now have a lot of different options that we've obscured from, from an Avalon Express site. Uh, they have a lot of you know, granular manifestations, and you can actually move them around on the page, and I'll, I'll show you guys a, a, um, a, a visual of what that looks like, but you know, these components now have a lot of different options that you can actually, uh, actually change. Uh, obviously, this is going to take more time. Um, these are not you know, prepackaged components that we're putting on a page anymore. These are individual implementations, so this is going to be a little bit more expensive for development, and then obviously testing is going to be a little bit more involved, and some customer education may also be required for maintaining the site. So these are this is the range you know that we tried to kind of come up with a concept that it would service both these markets. Um, and this is the breakthrough that we came up with. It's an idea called actor shapes and carrier shapes. Uh, so what is this? Like, you know, this guy's really off his rocker. Uh, what's an actor shape? It's, you know, Tom Cruise? Like, so basically, an actor shape is something that contains critical business logic. It's something that, you know, is required for your business to function. Uh, in our case, they contain a lot of the binding points for our knockout view models. So we had all these problems where people would override stuff and we'd change something, it would break. All this stuff is now centralized in one place. Uh, they will consume models from instantiating shapes. So if someone calls an actor shape, you're going to give it data. You're going to give it business data. You're going to give it settings. You're going to give it, you're going to tell it basically how to manifest itself and what it's doing. Uh, they can be bundled together. We have a lot of actor shapes that come in default configurations for an Avalon site, or we can cut them up and move them around in a phantom site. So they come in, in two different ways. You have to have a damn good reason to override an actor shape at the theme level. And, and whenever I go through a site and look at the theme files, if I see something that's obviously an actor shape, you know, like, Rear, like, what are you doing here? You know, the idea being that these should almost never be overridden at the theme level. They should all pretty much live exclusively at the platform level. Uh, we have now carrier shapes, which, as you can probably guess, are basically the structure of the page. You know, it's, it's kind of like the shelving where you're going to put all of your components. Uh, they have minimal client-side binding, if any at all, and they contain no business logic. They're actually pretty stupid. Uh, semantic HTML only. You know, forget burning Bootstrap into any of your uh, HTML. We don't do that anymore. Uh, this is where all of the site-specific markup, you know, they want to take stuff for their PDP and put it in an accordion, put it in a series of tabs, you know, do something crazy with it. This is where you do all that stuff in the carrier shape. And, like I said, you know, all, all the crazy stuff that they want that's not business critical, this is where it lives. So, and we're expecting that you're basically going to override a carrier shape, and that's okay, because all of the business logic is in the actor shape. And that remains at the platform level, so we can update it easily, and we can 
you know, have a site that's very easy to roll new builds onto and it doesn't break every time we make a change. So if we look at you know, the components we would use for an Avalon site, they're, they're kind of prepackaged, and this is our product size color picker. Basically, to add anything to a cart in our system, you need a, a product ID, a color ID, and a size ID. So these are kind of examples of you know, what this component would look like. It's three or four preset configurations. Uh, you know, obviously, when we're designing sites to use these components, we'll pick one of these four. Uh, whereas if you're doing phantom site, you know, we've broken up, basically taken that product color size picker and broken it out into its component shapes. So now you have these very granular, uh, you know, very granular pieces of functionality that can be themed in different ways. You see the one that has a kind of a circle for the size and some do pull downs and some do color swatches and some do little thumbnails. So this is you know, kind of some of the more custom implementations that we've done. Um, if you look at a PDP for an Avalon site, uh, you can see everything in blue would be considered a carrier shape. It's something that would live at the theme level. So you know, to move arrangements around, to, to, to do whatever you want to do. And anything in green is, is considered an actor shape and that, that comes out of the platform. So you know, the, the zoom situation over there with all of the different thumbnails, that's, that's a prepackaged configuration. And, and the product size color picker, I, I put some Dash, dashed lines in there so you can see where the individual pieces are, but that's, it basically comes out in one piece, uh, as does some of the product information underneath it. So this is you know, basically a very you know, kind of standard implementation, but you can still move some stuff around. You can put the, the zoom on the right, you can put the product information on top. So that there's, some, you know, there's, there's some configuration. Um, you know, like I said in the, in the slide, Layouts at the theme level, you know, platform you know, widgets come out in predetermined configurations, and basically at this point, you know, the themers are basically putting stuff together to match the comp. Uh, whereas in a phantom site, we've taken all this functionality, we've broken it up. There's still you know, the, the big carrier shape at the theme level, but now it's calling individual pieces of functionality. So this is, happens when people want to do crazy things like put things in tabs and flyouts. They want to change the order in some weird order. So you can do all of that. But they're still platform widgets. We're just now exposing more of the granular configuration that they offer. Uh, obviously, doing something like this takes a lot more time for us to create. But it's fine, because all of that critical business functionality is still in one place. It's at the platform. Um, so for an Avalon component, calling it from a view is very simple. Uh, you do something like display the product size color shape, and you feed a bunch of options into it to, to tell it to do it with its components. Uh, you know, this is not, this is actually still kind of a prototype. We, we, we're not quite at this point of granularity yet, but we're getting there. But you can see, you know, basically, it's one line of code to, to render this complex component. Whereas if you're doing more of a phantom type situation, you know, now we're breaking up all of those individual little components and calling them individually with their little options. So this is still, you know, we're still following our model, but this is just a more granular custom implementation. We see some custom HTML for the size chart, and that's not really a platform component. Um, and just a quick view of our source code. This was uh, the Fry site before we replatformed it with Avalon. You can see there's a side nav, column, SM3, some nice bootstrap classes in there. No one knows what any of those divs are for. Um, I don't know, it just, uh, it's just a side, a side nav. We have a, a nice row there, uh, and then we have a, a, a bottom footer, which I guess is a footer, we're not sure. Uh, and this is what it looks like afterward. Uh, we have things like zone breadcrumb and OS item media, which means item media, OS item detail, um, OS product details. You know, this is actually, you can look at this markup and actually have an idea of, of what it actually does. Uh, all of these things are kind of you know, then tied together. Right now we're using Bootstrap, but because of this model, we could dump it and go to something else if we really wanted to. Uh, so this is obviously cleaner to read. The code actually ends up being smaller, which is better for, for download. Uh, so this is definitely a, a pattern that's, that's worth pursuing. Just to look at some of our live sites, um, Aquatalia was a site we launched this year. We consider it more of an Avalon site. It's a very standard implementation of the PLP. Uh, Fry Boots is probably the most complicated site we've ever launched, um, also on the Avalon framework. It actually has two different PLP implementations. The one on the center is a very standard implementation with a fancy parametric filter, and then there's one on the right-hand side, which they call this Explorer View, which is probably really cool on a tablet. Um, on a desktop site, it's a little bit weird. If you guys are on your computers, you can check it out. But the, the 
the amount of code commonality between these three implementations is very, very high. I'd say it's a, about 80%. And anything in the right-hand side you know, is building off of the components in the middle and the left-hand side, so it should be, we hope, very easy to maintain. But this was, we had a developer do this in about five days, um, the one on the right, which is, I mean, that would have taken weeks under our old model. Um, same thing with PDP, you know, Aquatalia is PDP, pretty standard, you know, they have a couple of, you know, they wanted to, these giant uh, suggested products, things on the bottom. Again, Fry Boots, uh, crazy imagery, you know, all of this stuff in different positions, they have this weird leather background thing. Again, you know, parts commonality I think is even higher here, it's probably 90% between the one on the left and the one in the, the middle and the right. Uh, so this has been a, a really... It's been a really good framework for us to build these sites on. So another thing that we actually ended up doing a lot less of is overrides. Uh, Pre-Avalon, we had between 50 and 90 shape template alternates. It's not so good. Uh, we're down to about five to 18. We actually had a site launch with four. Uh, so we've gotten a lot better at not duplicating this code over and over and over and making it very hard to maintain. So that's, that's a huge win for us. Uh, so tools of the trade, you know, we changed all of our markup to be semantic. We got rid of all of our bootstrap you know, layout classes. Uh, we put in semantic IDs and, and class names for our DOM elements. Also made our automated testing a lot easier because now our Selenium scripts have something to actually look for as opposed to saying, you know, well, the fifth div, you know, this button, click it. No, there's actually an ID you can look for now. So QA loves that. All of our styling is powered by CSS mixins, which has given us a lot of flexibility. And we talk about this concept of Avalonification, which means we've gone through a specific part of our site, uh, account details, order history, and we've you know, basically applied this pattern. So we've stripped out all of the uh, layout classes. We, we've put in, you know, kind of wired in styles to our, our variables files. So you know, once we've, we've done that, assumedly it will just work. Uh, we've named all of our carrier shapes, you know, whatever, product details layout, so you can actually see them very easily in the theme. And again, we've tried to minimize our actor shape overrides at the theme level. Ideally, there's none. Um, so this is kind of, you know, the way we work now. Oh, sorry, I changed that last night. This is, this is all the changes we did in our commerce modules. Uh, we also made some changes. Uh, we have a module called Resource Bundler, which I don't know if some of you probably have worked with. I know Sifka, his face is lighting up. Uh, it overrides the Orchard Resource Manager, and it uses, you know, you call it, like anything else you call, require and include nomenclature. Uh, it does runtime compilation of less files, which is huge for us, because we've moved to this highly less dependent infrastructure. Uh, it also does bundling and minification of CSS and JavaScript files. Uh, there's a lot of debate, I think, about whether or not bundling is really worth it. We have the option to do both. Um, it's generally pretty transparent to users and developers. You know, they a lot of times don't even know they're using it unless something would go wrong. Uh, and we had to make some improvements for it for Avalonification. Uh, we refreshed some of the components, uh, upgraded our compilers. Uh, we changed the logic to make it perform better in a shared hosting environment. Uh, we added, this is a big one, we added the ability to process uh, CSS import statements. And Obviously, again, this makes it easier for developers, but this also enabled us to have a mixture of module and theme level less source files. So we have a variables file, sits at the theme level, and then all these less files in the modules are, are basically expecting those variables to show up. So this was, this was a big, big plus for us. Um, so this made development a lot easier, um, and it took a lot of work. <laughs> Um, so a bit more information on resource bundler. So we have some advantages. Obviously, there's no build time of guessing which files should be included. We, we tried to come up with a strategy. Well, we'll just compile all of our less at build time. And, and we couldn't really come up with a, a reliable way to do it because certain sites have certain modules turned on, certain sites, you know, there, there's this dynamic state of the application at runtime that's, that's kind of hard for us to predict. There's really no additional development requirements. You can develop your CSS and JavaScript the way you always have. Uh, like I said before, our CSS bundles are, op are optimized for application state at that time. So if you turn on a new module, all that stuff gets compiled automatically. You turn off a module, that stuff will drop out. Um, and again, you know, our module level CSS is waiting for those variables that we've defined at the theme level. So it will just pick up all of that branding and styling and, and, and basically just style itself. 
We have a couple of challenges. Uh, so these import file includes are great for developers, but they're not really seen by the resource manager. So if you change one of those included files, it doesn't always pick up the change. So sometimes you have to just touch the theme.less file, which is seen by the resource manager, so it, it dynamically recompiles itself. We do a lot of caching, as I'm sure a lot of you guys do. So sometimes you'll, people will change something and they'll put it up live, and it, it may take a little while for it to show up. Um, all of these compiled bundle files are currently stored in our media folder. IT doesn't really like that. Uh, so we're trying to figure out uh, some solutions for that. And then obviously, we do output caching on, on a lot of our pages, and we also host a lot of our stuff in Akamai. So you know, these bundle files, you know, the, the references go out in the wild. And that means that if you're going to go through and purge all of your old files, you have to be a little bit careful, because someone might be looking for that. So it's a little bit of an operational wrinkle. But we still like it. Um, we're still trying to make it better. So anyway, after all that, it's nice here. Um, so for launch, we can now get an MVP site out the door in about four to six weeks. We, we reached our goal. We actually had a site go out in a week and a half of development. I can't really write that down because everyone will want that, but the number can actually be lower. Um, this is a new one. Uh, if we provision our default theme, there's five files and the site just works. Before that, you had to put all these overrides and all these theme files in to, to get any site working off of our platform. I thought that was stupid. So, so now, basically, the platform works you know, naked with pretty much you know, no, start, no, no files required at startup. Uh, because of this much shorter development time, QA has all this time now that they never had before. We can lock a site down for three weeks of testing now. We, we, we couldn't do that before. So QA loves it. Uh, partners love it because they actually can stare at the site for a week, two weeks, three weeks, and find all those little annoying things that you didn't think were important that they're like, no, you have to fix that. So maybe it's not so great for us, but partners love it. Um, sites typically launch with 10 bugs, uh, no bugs in the purchase path, which is great for us. And these are usually minor, you know, oh, your pixels are off here, or, you know, the border's too thick. So they're, they're very, you know, they're, they're pretty much buttoned down at this point. Um, we budget maybe three to four days of cleanup for maintenance after we actually launch the site, and then we hand it off. So that's, that's down from 100 hours, which is great. Uh, and we actually launched a site the day I left for this conference. We launched Spider, which is a, an apparel, make, they do snow boarding apparel. Uh, I was on a plane to Paris, and it was fine. I, I, oh, we launched a site. I usually get the email now after it happens, which is awesome. Um, as far as maintenance, uh, retaining those actor shapes of the platform has definitely made putting new builds of our platform much, much easier. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to get close to a more continuous deployment model, so every new build not requiring supplemental work is, is awesome. Uh, all of the features are, are still centralized at the module level, so we make changes, we make updates, you know, we just basically write once, deploy everywhere. It's, the dream is actually true. And this is also a very important level of effort is for new implementations is now a lot easier for our sales team to, to figure out because they can look at a very standard component set and say, okay, we don't have this. What's it going to take for us to do this? Is it a platform update? Is it custom theme development? Uh, before, you know, they always thought that sites just you know, kind of materialized out of thin air. So now it's, it's really easy for them to say, oh, you've got a lot of custom stuff here. We're going to have to push your launch date. So, so far, it's been pretty good. Um, no nervous breakdowns, and our flowers budget has been greatly reduced, which is awesome. So to wrap up, um, Avalon framework, use far less overrides, make your themes less brittle. Uh, we took out all of our layout classes from our DOM. Um, basically, our themes, these carrier shapes, now turn pieces of functionality on and off at a platform level, which is great. Uh, and obviously, you know, a simpler DOM, a cleaner DOM, you know, we can, our branding is a lot more quick. And we now really enabled a lot of control with CSS. You can push stuff around on the page. You can move stuff around. It's actually pretty cool. Uh, some lessons learned. Do not repeat yourself. We paid for this a lot. It's really true. Um, basically, whenever you're building something new, try to make it the simplest possible solution. It, it sounds cool to build all these new pieces, but you're going to have to maintain all that stuff and oil it and, and buy gasoline for it. it. It takes a long time. 
Uh, try to think 10 moves ahead. We had, you know, especially with some of our orchard sites, really been focused on just getting it out the door and not really thinking what happens six months from now. We know what happens six months from now, so we're making better decisions. Um, obviously, you know, we all know this, the less code you write, the better generally your solution is. And you know, consider maintenance, and you know, not just this get it out the door mentality. You're gonna be living with this code for a long time. We have a site that's still in Orchard 1.6, and that's like three years old, four years old. Um, so, and they're still with us, and they're actually one of our more successful partners. So we have to figure out how to maintain that stuff. Um, so think about it. it. It's, you know, the sites, you know, sometimes live a long time. Um, so that's all I've got. Uh, I know I probably threw a lot of information at you guys. I think some of you are still jet lagged. I think that guy over in the corner is actually asleep. So, um, who has questions? One, two? Okay, we, we are, we'll have lots of questions, I'm sure. Um, I have questions. First, I have the mic. Um, so your designers have to type at display dot foo bar parameter and stuff like that? Uh, not the designers, the, the theme the theming engineers, I'm not sure what we call uh, them. And now. I'm sure they would prefer to type semantic tags and attributes and have IntelliSense instead. That'd be great. Yeah, Taylor will do that. <laughs> That'd be awesome. And Nick also. Yeah, next, next question. Another question. Um, can you remind me the cycles between love and hate and love and hate of Orchard? If you had any cycles? Uh, and what's my, the status my, my, right now? My personal cycles of love and hate? You or? were not from 2011? You didn't join One Stop before 2011? Uh, it, we started right around the... I think they were a year into it when I joined. We had, I think, two, two sites. We had so did, did you have these cycles? Did I have cycles? Of uh, love and hate? I don't know about, I think hate's a very strong Good. word. <laughs> uh, frustration, uh, I think one of the big frustrations, and I think all of us share this, is just you know, the documentation is not great. So onboarding new developers is a lot of hand-holding. Uh, but I don't think I've, hate is a very strong word. I think uh, mostly love, I would, I would say. Good. Uh, is the resource bundler something you're sharing with the community? Um, I don't know. Uh, we're trying to figure out what the best path forward for that is. Uh, it's obviously something we've invested a lot of money in. Uh, if you're interested in maybe finding out more about that, maybe you should find me afterward. Buy me a drink, see what happens. <laughs> uh huh. So, w when does it do the bundling? Uh, on request time. At request time. At request time. So, lots of caching. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's, initially we had it doing a lot of file system checks uh, to basically find out, it, it, will, it caches kind of, and I, I'm not sure if this comes out of resource manager or something that we added, it caches all the state of all of its files that it's bundling. Uh, and there was a lot of file system checks and all of our, our themes are hosted over UNC share, or no, it's, the media is hosted over UNC share, so that actually got very slow in our shared hosting environment. We have anywhere from four to eight nodes for every site. So now, resource bundler is basically set up, when the application starts, it does a check once, and then it, it persists everything in memory. Um, so so it's do, you, do you have the problem where uh, different pages in the site actually end up building different bubbles? Uh, yeah, that, that can happen. Uh, I don't know if it's a problem, uh, but well, yeah. Well, it makes caching down the, down the line. Well, yes, and like I mentioned, you, know, you may end up, you know, as your site, ages and you turn things on and off, you know, your, your bundles are gonna change. Uh, the thumbprint will change. So obviously you may have pushed stuff into output cache that has an old bundle. So you have to delete those, you know, delete those bundles very carefully. Usually, I mean, in our case, every time we deploy a theme, we do a, a, a shell restart. Sometimes we do a, a full app pool recycle. So it's a very controlled environment for us, but occasionally we go in there and have to purge some of the, the files. It, it, you have to be careful. Do you include the version number in the URL? No, not currently. Hmm? You don't need uh, There's a thumbprint of basically, the thumbprint is a hash based on content and it's based, it's based on a uh, timestamp. So, so as stuff changes, you're gonna get a different hash every time. So that, that's how we cache bust. 
you were saying about uh, team engineers. What what kind of profiles profiles are in your team, and what do they do in Orchard? Uh, so we have we did a reorganization earlier this year uh, when Sipka was you know, working with us. We had two teams for our platform. We had a a legacy platform team, and we had we called it the new platform team because it was the new platform. Uh, we've changed that now. We have a single core of engineers that does all platform work, soup to nuts. We organized along the Forrester verticals. I'm not sure if you're familiar with those. So there's four. They, they, they take an e-commerce business and divide it into four different chunks. We have a team focused on commerce, which is basically everything from, you know, oh, I see a product all the way down to checkout, basically when you hit place order. We have a team focused on order management, which is basically everything that happens after place order. Uh, authorization for credit cards, warehouse inventory, shipping, returns, all that good stuff. We have a team focused on, it's called PIM, it's basically the product catalog. And then we have another team which is called customer experience, which is basically all of the CMS tools and all of the other stuff that, that kind of you know, sits in that world. So that's, and we've combined those two teams because right now we only have two people. So those are like, we have a core of, that's the platform team, for lack of a better word, that builds all those platform level features. And then we have a, another team, we call them the launch team which actually does the implementation. So they do mostly new sites. Uh, they're starting to do maintenance on, on existing sites. We're thinking at some point we may combine that team with our maintenance team. Uh, but this is a, it's a, kind of a new paradigm for us. In the past, we had a completely different department. We had engineers that weren't in engineering. Don't do that, it doesn't work out so well. So we pulled all that stuff into our engineering department. Does that kind of answer your question? Um, so it's, and obviously what we've done, you know, we, we don't want to make anyone a second class citizen. So we actually have people on the launch team that are contributing back to our platform. They will build something like parametric filter and, and, and they'll say, you know, we found a bug. Great. Contribute it back to the platform. Uh, we, we, you know, we built this new thing that we need for three different sites. We'd like to add that as an option to one of the actor shapes. Great. Contribute it back to the platform. So it, in some ways there are best. They're like the best test lab we can have because they're actually out there doing the implementation. Platform teams are usually building to a spec that's either done by product or done you know, sometimes by me. So it's kind of a little bit of a uh, sealed environment, whereas you know, the, the guys out there on the front lines doing the implementation actually have a lot more knowledge of what works and what doesn't work. So we, we try to make sure that there's plenty of back and forth. Um, who else? Yes. Speak loudly. Yeah, okay. Is there any special process for syncing uh, all the uh, source code uh, and releasing to get the platform? Microphone, don't speak loudly, use a microphone. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, so is there, is there any special uh, process about syncing uh, the platform and the all the uh, releases? Uh, yes. Uh, we I think that it's... Uh, it's a problem for many. Yeah, it's a problem. Uh, we, so we started, I mean, and we've been at this for a very long time. Uh, we started, I didn't even know, 1.3. Was it 1.3? Do you remember? Do you guys remember? 1.3, 1.4. And they would, and this was before I, I was, you know, kind of a uh, keeper of that whole shebang. They would, they would cherry pick stuff and they'd, you know, chain, make changes. And we got to the point with, at the end of our 1.7 release, where we basically were pretty much with parity with what was out there in the community. Uh, and our 1.9 release, which we, we missed the deadline to deploy by two weeks because we had an engineer leave. It was very painful. Uh, we dumped basic. So we have, we have two repositories in, in Bitbucket. We have, you know, if you look up one stop, you'll see one stop at Acme, which is basically the Orchard core as we, as we use it. And then we have a, all of our supplementary modules are in a second repository. So for our 1.9 release, we're dumping <coughs> one stop Acme entirely. And we're, we're building a new repository that is pretty much what you get out of the community. And we just, we have a, we have a branch in source tree that we just basically, we're following the 1.9x branch and we just pull updates off that branch. So that, that's how we've solved it. Um, it in the end, it, it just makes it so much easier if we just, you know, and again, it goes to extensibility. It goes to, you know, overriding and, and trying to work with the framework the way it's designed versus, well, we'll just change this and we'll change that. Because then, you know, we have a bug and you know, we reach out to the community like, yeah, we don't, we don't have that code. Let's, you guys are on your own for that. And uh, crap. So we just, we try not to do that now. Um, so now the onus is on you guys to make better code. So, who's next? 
So George, so um, using those actor and carrier shapes, does it mean that you've just dumped using widgets and layouts? Absolutely not. Um, widgets and layouts are still important for us. Layouts especially is something we use a lot. This is more for, uh, it's more for, for stuff that is not brand specific, if that makes sense. Uh, we use you know, one-stop layouts and slideshows in probably every site we build. Uh, we're eagerly awaiting the launch of our 1.9 platform so we can use the orchard layouts. And I found a couple more bugs, Sipka, so we'll talk about that later. Um, but this is, you know, the actor shapes and carry shapes are more for stuff on the purchase path. It's for stuff that is not configurable in the admin uh, and stuff that basically we think is mission critical. Um, you know, checkout, I think, is a good example. We're launching a new version of our checkout. I think it's actually going out today. Uh, we've never, ever allowed sites to change checkout before for the reason being that it's the most important page on our site. It's the page where people pay. So we're very, very hesitant to mess with anything that, that would disrupt that. Uh, but thanks to this actor and carrier shape model, you know, we have, a, a, I'll say it's Fry. Fry wanted to take the payment info for credit card and move it, you know, the address, the billing address and move it next to where you put in your credit card. It seems like a reasonable idea. Uh, so we have a basically a layout shape for checkout that now lets you move everything around. And we had to do some refactoring of our JavaScript view model because our JavaScript view model in the past was very, you know, we had five steps and those five steps were hard coded and you couldn't really change the order. So there was a fair amount of refactoring that had to go into allowing that to happen. But now that we've done that, you know, you can move things around. We had they, a request to take, we had payment in tabs. There was credit card and PayPal and, you know, obviously we'll probably add Amazon and Apple Pay. They wanted everything just in a list. Great, that's fine. All those tabs are at the uh, carrier shape level. So just when you put in your new carrier shape, just put them where you want them. Um, so that's, that's worked out for us. But I think, yeah, but definitely layouts. Because ideally, that kind of changes. We want people who aren't engineers to be doing because we don't have very many of them and they're very expensive. Ideally, we'd really like our partners to be able to do it. And, and that's, again, Orchard Layouts is, is, represents a big opportunity for us because then they can, do, they can change the site every day for all we care and we don't have to be involved with that. Um, so definitely, definitely using layouts, using loving. Next. Hi. Um, I am probably what you call a theme engineer. Mm -hmm. I'm not massively strong in the C Sharp department. Um, I've been trying to get .less to work in Orchard for a, a little while now. Um, the standard modules don't seem to work, they're in the library. How did you convince your stakeholders and your development team that it was worthwhile investing time to get this semantic um, dot less system in place? That's a good question. Um, I started bribing them with alcohol. Um, <laughs> There might have been a budget for some slightly illegal activities. Um, basically, uh, and this is probably not the answer that you want to hear, we didn't ask permission. Um, the Avalon project was kind of a Skunk Works project. We had been able to demonstrate that the current launch process wasn't working. And as a test, we did, so we, we obviously, engineering made this commitment to build this framework. You know, we wanted. We wanted to, to, to make it better, faster, stronger. We had to build the technology, we didn't have it. So we had a site, which I can't tell you what it is because it hasn't launched yet, but it's a brand that all of you, especially in Europe, know. And we, our proof of concept that we presented to our board was that we had an engineer take uh, the basic site to fully brand it in nine days. So we've never been able to do that before. And, and obviously, it's kind of a weird situation because this partner had never really cared about its U.S. business very much. And now they've all of a sudden decided to care about their U.S. business. So we're in the weird position of actually selling, trying to sell them on something we've already built and haven't told them yet. Um, but I, I think it, you just have to, if you have numbers to back up the fact that your current process isn't working, I think that helps. Um, it also helps to have a pretty supportive vice president of engineering who, who basically wanted the process to work better. Um, I think, obviously, lower cost of maintenance is also a big selling point. If you can quantify that, then it, it's easier to make that sale. Um, who's next? You're all asleep? Jet lagged? Come on, I answer all the questions. Hi. Um, do you use any other CMS? Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, on, I think I know the on our at our company period or on our current e-commerce websites. Uh, yeah, I I don't know. We have <laughs> so we have a, we have a legacy. Uh, I don't really want to call it a CMS. It's more like a scheduling system that basically you can put JSON data in and we'll spit it out at a date and time. But basically, no. Basically, Orchard is our only CMS, especially for for sites like this. Just to mention that XK project, their website, it's on WordPress. So not for long. Which, which, which site are you talking about? No, XK project, Sergio, oh, Steam. Oh, yeah. No, actually, our current onestop.com site is also on WordPress. Um, okay. Very embarrassing. But that's fine. No, it's not fine. Uh, th that's going to change. So we're, we're already working on that. OK. It was made by old commercial department, no developer. So, well, we have Yes, ours was made by Creative. Developer. They just went and did it and didn't tell anybody. And we're like, really? Really? So. OK. Thank you, George. Thank, Thank you very much.